Hey everyone, we're back with another episode of Find Your Film. This time it's a director's sp spotlight, director's spotlight courtesy of Bruce Perky. His director's spotlight, I don't, we're still wondering how to pronounce his name. I am going to say Leos Carax. Bruce Perky, how would you pronounce that name? I'll go with the same, uh, although it might change as we proceed, but I will say Leos Carax. Leos Carax, and that is Bruce Perky. He's renamed himself this week or this weekend Perk Nuf. Per, per, Nuf, N -U, N -U -F? Is that how you say it? Nuf, I, I'm hoping. Yes. It, it's my name, so I can say it however I like. But yes, I'll be <laughs> Perk Nuf. 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 And then we have also, we're joined by Eric Holmes, who is courtesy. I didn't know he's actually working in the car industry. He is Holmesy Motors. Holmesy Motors. Eric Holmes, did you have a fun week or two, or just maybe the last week, several days, checking out these movies? Uh, yes, I did, but... That's enough of that for now. <laughs> <Get into it. laughs> That's an oh boy. That's Actually, it. I didn't mean that. I just had to use I, the the pun was sitting right there. I'm like, oh, I gotta let it out of me. <laughs> but uh, yes, I was uh, quite surprised with uh, both of these. I mean, I figured I'd like Holy Motors just because of uh, Bruce's reaction to it. Like mm -hmm. he kind of had that dude. Wait till you see this. So I knew we were in for something special. And then the uh, Lovers on a Bridge was uh also special but in a completely different way so oh very cool wait to get into these now bruce when we start off why was this your director's spotlight have you always been enamored of his work or was this a director you just really wanted to research um well how it uh, basically i had seen holy motors back about the time it came out and it kind of stuck with me because there's several things in there that I thought were super memorable. Uh, and then this year I had come across uh, Tokyo, which features a short by him. And then I was listening to actually Joe Dante's podcast and one of his guests had mentioned a sequence from uh, Mauve Sang, which we're not talking about today. Right. So I went and searched out Mauve Sang and then it struck me. I'm like, wait, that's the same guy that was in Holy Motors. And then I looked up the IMDb page for Leos Carax. And I was amazed, first of all, that he'd only made like five or six features. And I was doubly amazed by, after seeing one from, you know, 19, what was that, 1984, I think, 86, Bad Blood. And then seeing another one in the, the 2000 and teens and seeing like, this guy has been making vibrant, interesting movies and he doesn't make them very often. And that fascinated me. So then I was like, okay, I'm going to pick one I haven't seen and pick one I have seen and dive into this guy. Cause to me, he's, he's kind of in almost Kubrick territory as far as like making incredibly imaginative, interesting, creative movies, but very seldomly. So, and last but not least, I was thought it would be very good to bring it to the plate right now because he has a new movie this year. Oh, new movie this year. I, I read a little bit about it. It's with Marion. Cotillard is starring in it. I think it's called Annette. So, yeah. and Adam should... Driver. Oh, and Adam Driver. So, this and is it's good... a musical. Wow. Well, we're going to get to that musical <laughs> stuff when we pretty soon in a, in a few moments. He, he knows, Leos Carax knows how to actually lens and shoot a musical. He has that. Well, he can, he can pretty much do anything, as Bruce alluded to, regarding him being in this Kubrick, Kubrickian territory. Eric Holmes, did you find, from watching these two movies, did you find a, a director with a pretty singular vision? What did you love about his aesthetic? Um, Kind of no. They're both very stylized, but they're stylized in completely different ways that if, the only way I would know that it was done by the same director is because uh, of uh, Denis Levant, is that, is that how you yeah. say his name? Mm -hmm. uh, he's in both of them. And, and well, first of all, that guy's awesome. I love that guy. And uh, he reminded me a lot of uh, Travis Stanberry, who played uh, Hank in Groupers. Mm, and, a little bit, yeah. And, and he just kind of had that same kind of, uh, same kind of energy. Looked a, you know, I mean, they kind of look alike, not really, but like they have that same kind of energy to them. And, uh, but other than... Uh, that and like the random weirdness but like we talked about uh we've talked about jobbers before who do uh they do good work but they're not uh their style isn't front and center they're just servicing the story and i think he does that but he seems to do it on like 
his style seems to come with the uh, don't give a fuck attitude to his filmmaking, which I think he has a lot of that because uh, he's just like, you know what? We want to put this weird shit in and fuck it. We're going to put the weird shit in. I don't care. <laughs> as far as visual style, it, uh, they look fantastic. Both movies look fantastic. They both have a style, but they're not a homogenized style. They The style uh, is striking, but it fits with the story he's telling at least in in the two that I've seen. Very memorable. Both of them are very memorable films. Bruce, before we get into Holy Motors, uh, Eric alluded to the sort of connection between Denny Levant and uh, Leos. What what do you think, and you've seen his earlier stuff, and why do you think they connect so well as far as collaborators? What is that like? I think at the beginning, he was kind of using Levant as like almost a stand-in for himself. Because at least in at least two of the movies that he did, the first three with an E, he named the character Alex, which is um, Leos's actual name, Alex. Uh, so I think he kind of put him as a stand-in. And then I think on top of that, he kind of found out that um, uh, Denis is like game for anything and super, and he has a super physicality. And as you see this, he's almost got that physicality of like a, an acrobat or a street performer or something. And as we will talk about, Leos Carax asks his actors to do a lot of things physically in his movies. And uh, so so I think that there's kind of a, I think he kind of found a partner in crime, like kind of a a like-minded person in some aspects and someone that could kind of be a stand-in for himself. Yeah, I mean, when you look at Denis Levant's work, especially we're gonna start off first with The Lovers on the Bridge, you know, it, there's, uh, I'm thinking maybe Burt Lancaster used to ha- had that physicality to him. There's, I'm trying to think of other people. He reminds me of a little bit of a Brando, but then mixed it in with the indie spirit of a Steve Buscemi. This guy is a very talented performer. And in The Lovers on the Bridge, he plays, Denis Levant plays Alex, a homeless man living on the bridge. Bruce Perkins is going to talk about that bridge pretty soon. And he, he befriends this artist, Michelle played by Juliette Binoche. There is another person involved in that bridge, a friend of Alex's who who gives Alex his downers because Alex has problems sleeping. He's an insomniac, but you know, he he needs his downers, but then his drug of choice ultimately became becomes Michelle. They they strike a huge bond regarding the lovers on the bridge. This movie is critically acclaimed. A lot of people believe it's a very romantic film, dark film, was released in 1991. And it's, um, it's a celebrated movie. It is an acquired taste, though. There's a lot of people who love it. I was reading a lot of reviews. There are some people who were detractors. Bruce, yeah. your thoughts on The Lovers on the Bridge? Were you just highly impressed with what this movie had to offer? I was, I see it as, um, yes, I, I think it's really good. I don't think it's, I think he's, Leos is capable of masterpieces. I think this is like a flawed masterpiece. It's kind of like, it's so off the rails at some points that you're just like, okay, where are we going? And it's really hard also, I think, to to get a connection with some of the characters because they are very um, unwieldy in some aspects. You know, like the, the main character is Alex, but he's not a super likable guy. He's he's just kind of out of control. He's kind of down and out. He He's obsessive. I think there are some barriers to just immediately connecting to this movie. But that being said, there are some things in here that are just so, to me, undeniably dazzling and fantastic from a filmmaker standpoint that is, you just, if you like films, you should still watch this movie, even if you don't love the characters. So, Eric, do you concur with that regarding the lovers on the bridge? Were there moments of frustration regarding the characters or were you, were you pretty much swimming in the whole thing, the, the, the entire experience? Well, first of all, I was kind of confused at the beginning because uh, the lovers on the bridge, I was expecting like a uh, romance story. And it is, but <laughs> the, the, not I like mean, you think. It, it, it starts off with uh, uh, Alex head on the ground, like digging his forehead into the concrete, like scraping the skin off his forehead. And then he gets ran over by a car. And then they bring him to a homeless shelter. And I'm like, <laughs> this was like, another one where I had to pause it. I'm like, let me make sure I got the right movie. I'm not sure I got the right movie. <laughs> and then uh, most of the movie takes place on the bridge because uh, that's where Alex and the older guy live. 
and where uh, I forget her name, Michelle. Michelle kind of lives too. For, I mean, for the duration of the movie, anyway. Usually, like we talk about um, world building, and usually that means we're gonna put a bunch of stuff and people and this and that and you know, like uh, you think of like the the comic book movies, the Star Wars is uh, Dune would would be another one where like you talk about world building because there's a lot of stuff in there. But I thought this movie did a really great job of world building because for the most part, we're on that bridge. And even when they leave the bridge for a, a certain period of time, they say, let's go back to the bridge. Yep. Whenever whenever they said that in my in my mind, in my heart, I'm like, oh, we're going back home. Like it, it feels yeah. like home to me. And uh, I don't know how you would spoil this, but uh, when the bridge makes a transformation, we'll say it was it was a little disheartening that it wasn't what it was, but it still felt like home. You see, it still felt familiar. And that to me is really impressive world building that you can build this whole little tiny contained world and it means everything to these characters. And uh, I, I don't know what your guys' reaction to it was, but to me, it meant everything. And I, I just wanted to live in it. So the characters, you know, they had their, they had their problems. They definitely, uh, it gets weird sometimes, but <laughs> it was the play. It was a, uh, it was a world I liked living in for the two hours and it's a world I would like to go back to and check out again sometime soon. Hey, one thing, this movie has been described as romantic by people who've, re who've reviewed it from years past. We live in a world of cancel culture, woke culture, which I understand that has definite, has its definite mer merits with the divisive and racist climate we, we tend to live in these days. So the lovers on the bridge, if it was made today, there would be a lot of just critiques on it. And I'm so glad that this movie, I was talking about singular, this is a movie in and of itself. There's a lot of violence here that people would just be going, what the heck's going on? But that is called, even though a lot of this, the, this stuff in the lovers on the bridge, there's a lot of fire in this movie. There's fireworks, <laughs> there's fires, <laughs> and it's visually alluring, but there's also a lot of very devastatingly heartbreaking and violent moments that I don't know. It's, it, I think it's very, it was very gutsy filmmaking back in 91, and it would have been even gutsier filmmaking if a movie like the lovers on the bridge came out today. I wrote on my Google Doc regarding my reaction to the lovers on the bridge. Interminable, agonizing, lousy, messy. And then we get to a, a part, I'm not going to say when, and I, I, Anderson and I go back and forth on this. I think the most valuable shot in cinema is the close-up. Okay, maybe I'm 50, maybe that's just an old school theory on my part. There's a close-up of Juliette Binoche. And she has a monologue in this movie that I think has probably floored me. I've seen Juliette Binoche, as we all have in numerous films, but this monologue where she delivers just a, some memorable words floored me and made me realize how amazing an actor she really is. And there is a quote where she says, and I wrote this down. She says, the people in your dreams, you should call them when you're awake. It would make life simpler. And I think that really sums up a lot of Leos's work. He, a lot of his movies, they are grounded in reality and sometimes a reality we don't want to face. But there is a dreamlike state, which we're going to talk about a lot in Holy Motors, that, that actually in many ways becomes our reality. I find a lot of his stuff to be absolutely frustrating. I wanted to give this movie, after watching this movie, up to a point, I wanted to give it one star and it hit on that monologue. And then everything just came into place. I think he's a very frustrating filmmaker for me to watch, but there are moments that filmmakers I probably like better. They don't reach the heights of his work. Bruce, your overall, does, so did, did this movie have uh, its heightened moments for you as well, operatic moments as well that you'll treasure? Yes, yeah. I mean, the, the obvious ones, like the obvious, obvious one is the firework sequence and that, everybody would pretty much talk about that in this movie because it's fucking dazzling and insane. But even smaller things to me, and, and once again, I, I totally see your frustration. I am a little more bought in because I've seen enough now that I kind of I, I kind of love it. But I also was frustrated somewhat too. But other scenes like just the opening shot of a car traveling down a road and then it almost hits Denise Sylvain's character and then it almost hits Juliette Binoche's character. And it's like, that's how you introduce your characters. You know, that was, that was amazing to me. And there's another scene, another quiet scene 
where it's um, Michelle talking to the old man. And that scene is amazing as well. So I think that um, the highs in this movie are to me way over value it than the lows. And I think that this is also one of those movies that would improve even more on repeat viewings because I feel like you know what you're getting into. You can look at things in a little different light as well. And one last thing, and we're gonna talk a little more about the making of this movie, I think at some point, at least a little bit, the production, but all of his movies, and it's kind of interesting that he's gonna make a musical, all of them to some degree feel like they could be in that musical kind of world. And I think this kind of speaks to what Eric is talking about. Like this almost feels, it's gritty and realistic, but it also feels kind of unrealistic and like this giant stage that you'd get in like a classic musical or Umbrellas of Sherberg. We were talking mm -hmm. about that before. Yeah. It weirdly feels like that, even though it's the absolute opposite kind of like characters and situation they're in. Yeah, I think we're going to get to Holy Motors after we talk about the making of some extra information regarding the lovers on the bridge but just in interviews he leos was talking about how he makes films for himself and not for the viewers but then he qualifies that by saying but i know there are people who are going to see the movie so i have to take into consider consideration story structure and editing and making it look palatable or immersive to the viewers so he's giving a little bit of a uh, uh, you know, he, he says it's for himself, but he understands the reality of the situation. But that's what I, that's what I find really interesting about him. I had so many strong reactions, high and low. And I don't think I've ever had that for, for a filmmaker. I, I'm trying to think of filmmakers that have gotten me so frustrated and so inspired in one false swoop. Eric, do you have any filmmakers who, who do that for you? Um, hmm. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, no, this guy, this uh, I uh, can't, can't really think of anything. I, I did want to uh point out though, the uh, first of all, the uh, character Alex sure gets around on a uh, cast pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> the physical performance, uh, I, I think we already mentioned it, but uh, the physical per performance of Denny is pretty, pretty great through a lot of this. And did you guys get uh did you guys get a sense of like jump scares in this? But not like jump scares like horror movies, like you know, cats popping. Like when he's dancing on the ledge on the bridge, I'm just a, like, dude, you're gonna fall, <laughs> dude, you're gonna fall. Yeah. Or uh uh when someone punches someone else, but they come from behind the camera on the screen and watch them like uh like there's I, I noticed a bunch of jump scare moments in a movie that probably shouldn't you know typically wouldn't have jump scares which i guess is probably why they worked on me but uh yeah there's there's definitely a lot of uh tense you know i i, I felt tense a lot of times um and you know stuff coming out of nowhere but uh yeah as, as far as being a frustrating filmmaker i'm not frustrated with the two movies i've seen from them at all in fact and to your point about uh he makes the movies for himself but he has to like edit it and make it like look good. I'm guessing he likes movies. So he probably, <laughs> you know, it, I'm going to paint a picture for myself and hopefully other people like it, but I'm not going to just paint a white canvas because I yeah. don't find that interesting to look at and probably no one else does either. Or maybe they'll be pretentious and look at it and go, oh, look how white the canvas is. <laughs> it's about his soul and how the purity of his soul. I'm at least going to draw a line on it or something. <laughs> <laughs> well, The Lovers on the Bridge is not, like you said, it's not a white canvas, not a blank canvas. Bruce, can you tell our listeners about sort of like what Eric was talking about, the, the world building specifically of the bridge and this whole environment we see on screen? Yeah, and this is, I, I had no idea when I watched this movie at first that this is a really storied and known movie in movie history in France. It's like kind of their Heaven's Gate for people who aren't as old as us, who don't know what Heaven's Gate is. <laughs> that was this giant overblown budget of a movie that kind of became notorious for spending so much money to build these sets and stuff and, and for this artistic vision. And of course, we've had other things, uh, Waterworld and so on and so forth. Well, in this movie, they were supposed to have, I think, 10 days to shoot on the Pont Neuf Bridge, which is the oldest bridge in France. And the whole idea in this movie is that it's it was at that time under um, renovation. So that's why it's kind of this oasis for these characters. It's under renovation during that time. So they can kind of escape to this, this bridge. 
So they lost the time to shoot on the bridge in real life. So he went to some lake in the south of France and rebuilt an entire full-size replica of the bridge <laughs> and the facades of all the surrounding buildings and the streets right around it. And I sent a couple pictures to Greg and Eric and it's like wow. massive. And I, I think that's what creates this not only incredible like control of the space, it seems, I, I watched the scenes now, like the fireworks scene, we won't talk too much about it other than say it's amazing. And there's cars moving in the background. There's all kinds of stuff going on there. And it's like, that all is being done on this giant exterior outdoor stage. So uh, that's pretty incredible. And I think this production took like two or three years. Den Denise Levant like terribly hurt his thumb during the production. Mm -hmm. That should tell you a story of why something happens in this movie. He broke his foot. That should tell you about something that happened, why something happened in this movie. <laughs> uh, in wow. this movie, in the movie before, I think uh, Leos Carax was in various stages of a relationship with Juliette Binoche. So that's this whole thing. Oh, okay, yeah. And that will uh, come to play in Holy Motors later too. Oh, very there's, good. There's a scene that goes back to that. But kind of talking about your frustrations, Greg, I think to me, that's the epitome of someone who's really, really exploring their vision uncompromisingly. You know what I mean? Like, oh, 100%. 100%. It's like, if you can love and hate them, but you don't mm -hmm. feel mediocre about them at all. 100%, yeah. That's... That's uh, where the filmmaker should be in my book. That's, I mean, that's, that's why, it's, yeah. I was confused. I thought you were saying, if Greg hates it, that means it's a good movie. No, no. <laughs> oh, I mean, no. the fact that- It's one of those things. Yeah, I, I go back and forth in this movie. This is this is a movie I would recommend to cinephiles, if, and, but then I'll, have, I'll throw in that caveat is it gets very, it can get, be very, very frustrating. That said, yeah, I said this about Holy Motors earlier today. This is, that's a movie, we're going to get to that in a second, but from the two films I've seen, my opinion of him and his movies will upscale with repeated viewings because once you get yeah. the lay of the land on what he's trying to go for, then there's so much stuff to unpack as opposed to liking a movie and never watching it again. I'm going to come back to this. I'm going to definitely come back to Holy Motors. The Lovers on the Bridge, there are moments which I don't want to watch, but I'll tell <laughs> you, I'll probably watch that monologue a million times, the fireworks sequence, there is a seemingly almost one take sequence on a subway, which I thought was amazing. Yeah. Gorgeous. And there's so many different things about this movie to love in the aggregate. It's just, I think what one has to do if you're not a huge fan of Karak's work, and if you're not prepared, I think just get that first viewing down first, appreciate it for what it is, and then revisit it. And 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 then maybe you might've been slow on the uptake, but the next time you'll, you'll really enjoy it the second viewing around, so. So Greg, you, you didn't like the scene on the beach when they're running around with this old broomstick hanging out, <laughs> right? Exactly. You know, there's there's a there's a couple of sequences. You know, so traumatic <laughs> traumatic art gallery sequence. There's a couple Wait, things here. You know, well so. that that that, uh, that beach sequence because you only see them in in uh, for anyone listening, you only see them in silhouette. But there's like it look it looks like this freaking like. <laughs> <laughs> Dude is packing. Yeah, well, <laughs> I was like just... looking at that. I'm like, what? The, what's he got on there? And yeah. he turns around and then he kind of flops around. I'm like, oh, that's a boner. <laughs> that's yeah. a wicked huge boner. It's Denis, um, it's, it's Denis Levant, man. He's he's the man. I mean, he but, he he can proudly go out to sea. Unfortunately, I I can barely even take a bubble bath. So imagine he, that. He, so. Yeah, they'd be able to find him in the deepest of water so long as he lands back <laughs> back to the ground. <laughs> uh, you know, he could probably do front flips, back flips, side flips on that. So I mean, that's literally what he can do, folks, because we've seen him flip and we flip for a lot of his acrobatics in this movie. Yes, I did want to bring up the production design because I didn't even think of it. It, it all until Bruce sent us that picture of mm. the set they built for this. And it cannot be understated. That is fantastic. And I didn't even know, like, cause you should, I, I saw it after I saw the movie. So I'm watching it just like, Oh, this is just a part of wherever, you know, it, it looks like they're filming on location. And quite honestly, technically they probably are because that stage is so big. It would, uh, would that be like the biggest stage built? Because that, that that thing is huge. It's, oh, it has it's to absolutely be. enormous. It has to be it's one of the top right up there. Yeah, yeah. And right there's the no. It, and 
uh, may, perhaps uh, perhaps we post this on uh, cinematics or find your film or some, the picture, yeah. but it, oh man, that it cannot be understated how impressive that, that production design is. Cause that is just, I, I saw that and just blew my mind. And then what, and then watching the movie, I'm just like, holy shit. Like it, like, even when you know, it yeah. still doesn't, it still doesn't feel that way. I was going to mention one last little thing about this, but, and in that same sequence, um, first of all, people had mentioned, uh, he must be maddening to work with too. In the same way that you're maddened by him, Craig, he's probably maddening to work with. Someone mentioned like, he's the kind of director that would shut down the Champs-Élysées. And if you know what the Champs-Élysées is, like the biggest avenue in Paris, yeah, he'd yeah. shut it down for a cutaway of someone's hands. <laughs> like that's, that's the kind of director he is. But did you also notice, wasn't it really weird? There's this one really short sequence and it's probably less than a minute where he, they have built an oversized stage mm. when they're laying down and they, they wake up after they're drunk and they built an oversized version of a part of the bridge. So they look like they're miniature because all the stuff around them oh, is right. giant. Yes, yes, yeah. And they had to build that for one shot basically in the movie. And that was like, I was watching and I was doubting myself for a second. I'm like, no, that's all oversized. Why? Just for that one shot, <laughs> that's so weird. Well, look, I am maddened by him in a good way. There are things yeah. about him that are frustrating, but let's just, let's just make it clear. I have to give, you talked about uncompromising. I have to give this guy the utmost credit because you have a, a filmmaker who could have done at least four or five more films during his career and actually cater to the lowest common denominator, make tons of cash doing genre. We, we love genre. We love our genre films. I'm assuming he's very uncompromising and he wouldn't have wanted to maybe stoop to that level and compromise his, his own way of storytelling. I don't know. I just... He has the qualifications to make any movie he wants. And we're going to get to Holy Motors. And it's basically like he's making 20 different films, which is awesome. So isn't, isn't it weird? I mean, didn't you feel, I felt when I watched this movie at being a great, big, huge movie fan, I'm like, how do I not know about this movie? How did I not know about this movie? Isn't, did you, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, it's like, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, it elicited such a strong and passionate reaction. I, I'm so wavering on this movie. I would, again, I would recommend it. But the fact is I'm, uh, again, being madded. I'm, I'm a little bit mad. I'm a little bit mad that a lot of people, it, this movie is, doesn't get out there in the, in the forefront a little bit more. I'm, yeah. I'm wondering if uh, uh, Leos Carax directed Waterworld. If we, we bring an ocean to Mars. It is <laughs> otherworldly and we need an ocean. We will bring the ocean to Mars and shoot all on Mars. <laughs> That's but not right. the whole movie. No, we just need a close-up of Kevin Costner's hands. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Okay, so that is The Lovers on the Bridge, released 1991, starring Denis Levant, Juliette Binoche. And I don't know the third actor, the, the guy. He's, he's also good in this movie. And he's sort I of... I it down. It's, uh, it's yeah. Klaus Michael Gruber. He's very good in this movie as well. It's, it's basically yeah. a two-hander with civilization as her backdrop, but he is a very important element as well. Not, he's not just the guy who gives, gives the downers, okay? So he's, he has an important role as well regarding The Lovers on the Bridge. By the way, The Lovers on the Bridge is currently streaming on Paramount+, Plus, which, I, which is where I saw it. Eric Holmes how did you, and Bruce, how did you guys see this movie? I rented, I rented it. Oh, yeah, I rented it on uh, Amazon. Amazon. I think it was only like two, but like a dollar, two dollars. It wasn't expensive at all. Okay, cool, cool. And listeners, this is since I am the big sellout of the out of the three. If you ever purchase any of these links, I'm gonna put it in the show notes. If you actually watch it, order the Lovers on the Bridge or Holy Motors via our show links. We'll mention you and we'll tell us what you think. I'm a sellout. Yes, Air I, 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 I didn't. We we talked about physical media, and I should have looked this up, but I just thought of it right now. Is this on like a like Shout Factory or Criterion yes. or something, because yes. if, if there is one movie that I would absolutely love to see the behind the scenes on, it's this one, especially especially given the production design and, and everything that uh, went into making this movie. But okay. I, I, I don't know if you guys know or not, but I, if this has a uh, like a super special edition, I'm all in for it. There is a Blu-ray, but I don't know if it's a special, special edition at all. So I don't know. And we know there's also, I'm, I'm a, you know what? Probably I, there's definitely a shot factor or some kind of release on Blu-ray for Holy Motors, which we'll get into right now, but I'll leave those links as well. Yeah. If you guys see it through our links, shop, whether or not, just tell us what you think of the movie. We'll mention you on the pod, email us, shop through those links, hit us up. 
at info Criterion. at findyourscene.com. Yes, Criterion. Yeah, Lovers on the Bridge. Get on that. <laughs> get on. Yes, get on Lovers on the Bridge. Right. And Bruce Berkey, do you get on, do you get on Eric Holmes's quote? Yes, you second that. Yeah, I'm su- I'm amazed that at least one of his movies is not on Criterion. I don't understand how that has not happened yet, unless he just has a bad a bad relationship with someone at Criterion or something. Well, I, I know just watching some for some of his interviews, Leos Karak says not like making straight eye contact with a journalist, which I find a little bit maddening, but he <laughs> definitely angers and maddens me in a good way, in a passionate way, because cinema should pretty much be about passion, the best of cinema, at least. And that is what The Lovers on the Bridge is about, and also what Holy Motors is about, released in 2012. Bruce, can you tell us, can you just uh, do the intro for Holy Motors? What what can we even say about this movie other than I'm I'm a little bit envious. I've never been driven for a full day on a in a white stretch limo. So yeah, this is this is a hard one to describe other than kind of the basic concept. The basic concept is uh, early on in the movie, you're introduced to a character named uh, Mr. Oscar. It's like the old businessman, oldish businessman, you know, 50, 60, something like that. Who, who, who's the lead played by who? Denise Levant. <laughs> <laughs> and he goes, he walks out uh, past like armed guards and everything. And he's talking about different stocks and stuff. He gets into a big giant white stretch limousine driven by the character Celine, played by Edith Scobe, who she? which who is the the young woman <laughs> with the mask in uh, Eyes, Eyes Without with, a Face. Eyes Without a Face, which I, I apologize, I still haven't seen Eyes Without a Face. I hear it's so good. I think you love that like too, it. Eric, right? You love that too? Eyes Without a Face is very good. Very good, very good. So anyway, he gets into the limousine, she drives off, she says, uh, you have something like, she says something like, you have nine appointments today or something like that. And he starts pulling out a, a booklet and you're not sure if he's just like gonna meet different clients or what's gonna happen. And very quickly he gets out of the limousine and instead of being himself, he's like a, like an old lady, like a old homeless lady or something walking along the street bent over. Yeah. And then he gets back in the limousine <laughs> and you quickly discover like, oh, he's an actor and he keeps going to nine different roles. So basically that's the idea. You drop into all these different vignettes, all played by Denise, Denise Lamont, all looking different, variety of different sty- styles of sequences uh, some are emotional some are funny some are outrageous and like surrealistic and that's what we'll have to talk about uh i think this movie is fantastic i liked it when i saw it but it stuck with me and there's i think this is one of those movies it's almost an anthology in a sense yeah it's vignette driven definitely vignette driven anthology but it definitely works as a whole i mean it's talking about some things so it's definitely talking about some things speaking of some things eric holmes what did you think of holy motors i don't know if you meant this is what you meant by frustrating i didn't understand this movie at all but i loved it <laughs> like, Enough said. Like, i'm like i got no idea what's going on but this thing's so freaking insane i cannot wait to see what happens next because well, yeah that's you, interesting. Like, you go, like like he's going out as the the old lady begging for change and uh my first thought was oh okay he's uh he's a rich guy pretending to be a, a homeless person uh, to get money this is like a commentary on homeless people nope they get back in the car and they get out and then uh he's uh wearing a mo-cap mo-cap cap suit and then they're uh alien he's with another girl another woman with a mocap suit and they're it, it becomes cgi aliens having sex <laughs> i'm like uh this is a commentary on cgi I guess. <laughs> and he gets back in the thing and so like all these Wait, you forgot things... you forgot the running with the with the submachine gun with the mocap what, what do you oh yeah yeah that yeah that that happened too uh and and then he gets out and he's in a uh uh i i would say i don't want to spoil this but i don't know how you spoil this you could go front to back explaining everything that happens in the movie but this movie is so insane that without context like <laughs> I, I, I imagine anyone listening to this that hasn't seen the movie going, uh, yeah, that's not a spoiler. I have no fucking clue what you're talking about right now. Well, and I said a couple of times to you guys, I said, you have no idea what you're in for. And you oh, didn't, yeah. did you? <laughs> so. Oh, uh, the best the best scene by far, at least for me. And actually, it, uh, the, the uh, accordion scene. He's playing the accordion. And then more accordion players get behind him. And then you got a drummer and a bass player. And like all, all of a sudden he's got like all these people walking be, behind him. And then they're playing this just awesome fucking song. And quite honestly, 
I saw this last night. I've listened to that song like 20 times <laughs> since before, before we recorded, which I, I guess is a style of uh, Leos Carax is uh, his music. I, I, I love all his music that he uses in it. I uh, use a Kylie Minogue song, uh, which also right. she showed up later in the movie, but the, right. that, yeah, that was that playing one. when he picks Can't up you out of my head. Yep. The which is also weird. Yeah. Because he picks up his daughter. That's not his daughter. That's <laughs> he's playing the yep. character of this girl's dad, which is like the only thing I can get out of this movie is probably maybe it's a commentary on like uh, how we all wear masks in our data. Like uh, I present myself differently on this podcast as I would to someone at work. And I'm presenting myself differently to them as I would to someone that I meet at like at a, a cashier at a store or something, you know, depending on what situation I'm in, I'm different person, you know, to varying degrees. Maybe it has something to do with that. But I mean, whether it's about that or not, all I can say for certain is this movie is insane and I love every second of it. And I won't give this away because this was a fun reveal, but we'll just say the last scene before the credits roll. <laughs> we'll yeah. just leave it at that. But you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, worth worth watching. It's worth, uh, yeah, definitely, definitely worth watching the, la- the last scene. Again, I found this to be maddening and frustrating and brilliant. <laughs> all of these things because... Unlike you, Eric, I I have a you know what up my you know what, and I want things to be explained to me and force fed. And this is one movie that you can analyze to to the high heavens, but that will be your own interpretation. It's it's an it's a movie that can be interpreted interpreted so many different ways. And I think ultimately that's a good thing, listeners. I think what you should do is you go you go into Holy Motors not reading all of the essays or what it's about, and just go into it like Eric and I did. Bruce, you you saw this in 2012, and at least around that time, and you have a the site on the rewatch. You had a knowledge, but going into Holy Motors blind is a very great experience. And I that said, I, I was gonna actually analyze what what the movie is about. But for me personally, it's it goes back to I watched this before watching The Lovers on the Bridge, and I saw Holy Motors, especially what Holy Motors is about. That factory with well saying too much but there's a lot of li- there's so there's white limousines they sh- they shuttle you from experience to experience Denny Levant's character and in one sense he's living in reality and the other sense he's living in fantasy that fantasy is probably these different segments that he's living out as different characters can be interpreted as him playing different characters on the stage or especially since Denny Levant is like you said Eric a movie fan maybe the both of, he's enacting different sequences in movies, movies, cinema, which sometimes propel our lives. These rides to different areas are is the stuff that our day-to-day life is made of. Are we go into these different pockets of fantasy? And ultimately at the end of the day, we settle down with our family or loved ones, or maybe we're by ourselves. That we like to say that is our reality, but what are we doing the rest of the day? We're fantasizing, we're imagining ourselves in different parts of the world all these things all these things i found holy motors to be really a frustratingly awesome experience and i highly recommend this movie it it gets better as the minutes and hours and days progress for me bruce perky i've I've talked enough about holy motors so do you do you think that uh leo's corrects watched southland tales and saw it as a challenge (laughs) to accept (laughs) what do you think bruce he might have i mean he's he's a weird fucker i don't know (laughs) i don't know (laughs) So, first of all, I would say you probably will find parts of the sticking with you. I will say uh, watching it again, and I was just like Eric, by the way, when I first saw it, I mean, over the years, I will consistently post that accordion sequence just as a, a standalone watch this. But watching it again, this is a movie that has great rewatchability because every time I watched a sequence, I'm like, oh, this is, oh, this is the sequence. Oh, and I start watching it. And it recontextualizes because you do, especially on the second time, want to try to give it meaning. And also there is so much in here relating to other movies by himself and movies in general. There's definitely the reading that you have, Greg, is one that a lot of people have. This is about movie making or movies, uh, reality of movies. What is reality versus non-reality, all that kind of stuff. But there are other readings that can make sense too. Uh, I do want to point out if you guys didn't catch it, and I didn't catch it until I rewatched it because 
you're so, I guess you're so kind of blown over by so much coming at you in this movie that I had kind of forgotten the very, very beginning, which is the man alone in a room with a finger that's a key. Remember that whole thing? Yeah. That's Leos Carox. That is him. Oh. And that's a very Lynchian kind of thing, right? He's alone in this room. He goes up to a wall that's like a wall of like trees. Yeah. It's like trees on a wall. He he has this finger that's a key. He opens it, he pushes through, and he walks into a theater. And on the theater, all the people seem to be dead or asleep. And they're watching the screen. And then what you see on the screen is a little girl in a window which is his actual daughter. And he, this movie is dedicated to his, the mother of his daughter who is now dead. She died right before this, shortly before this. And then there's a lot of daughter stuff in this movie too. So that's another kind of a, a through line too, if you think about it, like Eric was talking about. So there are so many, re you could see the personal readings in this. Uh, you can see the, you know, meanings over cinema in general or uh, something totally different about society, like kind of like Eric had. It's really, really cool, I think. One last thing I wanted to mention. Go ahead. Uh, go ahead. You say I'll come back to it. There's well, one thing I want to talk I, about. I was going to kind of on on the, uh, the the what what it's all about. Um, the part where uh, Eva Mendez shows up for a bit, and you have the photographer going beauty, 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 and they're looking weird, weird, weird. <laughs> it, it, um, I wonder if. I wonder if that's kind of him, uh, Leo's Carax, kind of speaking to his own pretentiousness, maybe. And it's like, yeah, it's, it's stupid, but you know, it, you get, you get, uh, or I don't know, maybe he's picking fun. Of, I, I don't, I don't know what he's trying to say with this movie. Is what I'm. I will tell at. you that sequence. Yeah, that sequence. With... I, I, I get so, I get so much out of each individual like section of this movie. Well, I will say that the Eva Mendez, what I don't even know how to say Beauty and the Beast in French. I'm very bad with with language. I'll just say La Bête Humaine, and that is a that, that that has no idea. I'm just thinking that's a, that's a, a, another movie name. But that sequence with e Eva Mendez and and uh, Denny Levant is very pun intended. Finger licking good, finger licking good <laughs> sequence that you will never get out of your head. But yeah, that's an amazing that's an amazing sequence. There's so many one. You were gonna say something, Bruce, about Holy Motors. Uh, it's about a specific sequence. I, I will mention one thing about that. Do you notice the music in that playing all the way along with the uh, that crazy sequence you're talking about is yeah. Godzilla music? Oh, very cool. It's very both sequences in there have Godzilla music. But I was going to say one a perfect example of how he does things that are like um, can be seen as like a cinematic reference, but also a personal reference to his own work and maybe even something more than that. And I talk about the whole musical sequence with Kylie Minogue. So not only does he have the sequence where it's like, you know, it's kind of these lovers who missed each other and then it becomes a musical sequence in the kind of the classic sense, but then it happens inside the actual under renovation interior of that store. Oh, I wrote it down. What's the name of that store? Um, Samaritan, which is right next to the bridge, the actual bridge from the lovers on the bridge so that when they're on the top of that in the movie, they're looking across at the actual bridge from the actual building that they had to recreate for his other movie. So there you got this whole weird sequence. And then he names the character that she's playing as Jean, which is a reference to Jean Seberg, who had this fame as this actress that came to France and became famous in France in you know French movie history. So there's just all these layers. And I think that's where you, from, from sequence to sequence to sequence, you can just, there's so many things you can get if you want to get. And also it's just entertaining. Yeah, Jean <laughs> Seberg being the one who gained her fame internationally for, for the Jean-Luc Godard film, Breathless, which obviously because Leo Carax is, he was, con he was uh, in his day, he was considered the modern day Godard. And a lot of his stuff is, you know, really revered as as much as the filmmakers as the French New Wave, aka French Nouvelle Vague. Yes. Oh, last thing about that sequence. He originally was going to put Juliette Binoche in it. Oh, really? Yes. In wait, wait, as an as an addition or in no, as the part? character that ends up playing Kylie Minogue, it was going to be Juliette Binoche, but they couldn't get along because they were ex lovers. So the fact that, that he cast so somebody good. else in the role of Juliette Binoche in the role of somebody else. Stunt gog. 
But yeah. what's even better for this movie? It's like almost thematically better than it actually being Juliette Binoche, but just the fact that it was going to be her. Yeah, it works de- definitely on the themes, layers upon layers. Just really, Holy Motors is, again, I think both, you know, honestly, to be honest, I, I if both of these movies are on physical media, I know Holy Motors is definitely on Blu-ray. I'm going to get both copies just to watch different sequences and maybe even rewatch again. He's such an interesting filmmaker. Again, very few mi- the movie uh, m- uh, directors ever get me this pissed off about certain sections of their movie but make make me end up really really loving them it's like i feel like juliet benoche's character falling in love with denis levant <laughs> no good <laughs> can i quote though, anderson... even though i'm a little bit punch drunk yeah <laughs> can i quote anderson, anderson cowan on this real quick <laughs> yeah so <laughs> anderson cowan so i wrote anderson uh cinematics if you don't know about cinematics yeah. anderson cowan and greg's thank you there over there uh anyway uh, I wrote Anderson. I said, hey, we're going to be watching this. And I just wanted him to know because I know he had seen Holy Motors and kind of had the similar love hate with it, but also was fascinated by it. And I and I told him about the upcoming musical and, you know, how that's like an event. Like it, he never makes any new movies. He's making this musical. And Anderson says something to the effect of like, I, I can't wait to see it and I can't wait to hate it. <laughs> and I thought that's <laughs> that's a perfect response. Perfect. And look, I was looking at a couple of interviews. Oh, Bruce, would you recommend that documentary on Leos Carax as far as contextualizing his work? Yeah, I mean, Paula, it's called Mr. X, actually. Um, I would say it's it's okay. If you're a fan, it's worth watching. It's a lot of people that have worked with him talking about the work he's done, but it doesn't really dig super deep. So I don't think you're going to okay. get a I, ton I would, from it. I would say that, uh, like, especially Holy Motors, it feels a lot like David Lynch to me. Not, not in style, because, like, David Lynch is kind of darkly weird this kind of like fun poppy weird which is they're both weird but whatever but i I think a lot of the fun in david lynch movies is to not know and just try to like his his inland empires and his uh eraser head type movies not know exactly what he's going for but kind of you know just watch it again and watch it again after that and then just kind of pick it apart like Lewis corrects Holy Motors especially seems to be one of those movies that I would just want to watch over and over again, trying to pick it apart as opposed to watching a documentary or someone or yeah. uh, listening to a podcast other than this one, because this <laughs> is the perfect podcast. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> instead of someone trying to tell you how to interpret it, th- does that make sense? It feels like uh, you would get more out of his movies if you were able to kind of uh, make it more personal and interpret it interpret it yourself in how you feel or what, what you think he's going for well can i can i tell you something even this is what, no yeah no, <laughs> thank you thank you <laughs> this is what makes his stuff interesting you can even we you and i can we all three of us can argue and we can make this argument that oh the lovers on the bridge it's it's about two dysfunctional people and there's a third dysfunctional person they're living on the bridge and they do really mean things to each other and there's a lot of violence sometimes there's there's death involved and it's i don't like these people at all this movie sucks and it's crap that kind of surface conversation can go on because you're having such an emotional reaction it's just and that's just right off that's skimming right off the top you see what i'm saying these kind of most of these type of movies that are crap and unlikable characters that conversation is finished within two minutes this conversation is if you really hated the lovers on the bridge which i didn't the most I think the most superficial conversations on his work could probably last for so long. And that's what makes him, I think, a very, a, a visionary. I was checking out an interview and someone, someone was asking him, how does he write? How does he start the writing process? And he simply said, well, I, it's, hard to, it's hard to pretty much answer that. I start off with an image or a series of images. And then he, he starts from there. And that response is such a rare response because a lot of people will say, well, I start with the characters or the situation or the theme. He starts off with an image and then he starts building upon that. And yeah, it just, he's just a very interesting, I'm glad we picked him for, you picked him Bruce for, for this episode. It's just a very impassioned filmmaker. So yeah, yeah. That, that, the guy's definitely an artist. Like there, there's no question about it. Greg, you all, you often mention with interesting filmmakers, you always pause it like, wouldn't it be good if they had a hundred million dollar, you know, sure. budget to do, you know, or whatever it is to make whatever they want, which uh, I don't know what the budget for lovers on the bridge was, but I can imagine it wasn't, <laughs> I can imagine it was more than a hundred bucks. Cause that, that set was ridiculous. <laughs> He's an example 
of someone I would just want to see, like, just if you were a trillionaire, throw as much money as you can at this guy and just see what he comes up with. Because I imagine that it would just be, I, I can't guarantee I'll like it. I probably will like it, but I can't guarantee I'll <laughs> like it. But one thing I can't guarantee is like, this is going to be, there's something great's going to come out of this. So long as it's not a Ant-Man movie or a <laughs> Avengers <laughs> Still, I don't, I how dare you? Know. I still love those movies, Eric Holmes. In fact, my next spotlight will be on director Peyton Reed. Get ready for it. So, <laughs> Bruce, to, to your point, to Eric's point, it's. Do you think it's what's what's the what's so wrong in galvanizing the audience one way or the other, which his movies tend to do? Why are these filmmakers so rare, as opposed to most directors? Are they're trying to work the bottom line and to cast a wide net of positive reactions, wherein Leos, we all. He knows what, by making these stories, he's going to get a lot of people who would say, what the heck are you doing? But he's going to get so many different reactions, good and bad. I mean, I don't think you get very many of these because most people want to make money. I mean, this isn't going to make money, right? I mean, the studios don't think they're ever going to make money off of galvanized responses. I mean, if they could assume that the galvanized response was always like, we love it, sure. But that's not usually how it works, you know. Yeah. So and so you get mediocrity, you know, because that's gonna, you know, gonna sell. I mean, for example, I showed you guys. There's a couple posters for the lovers on the bridge that makes it look like Sleepless in Seattle. Oh sure, sure. Have you did you see that one poster? Yeah. yeah. And you're looking at it, you're like, oh, okay. And if you, and if I would have shown you that, this is what we're gonna watch. You know, guys would have been like, oh, what? So you can well, tell that even then, that some people at some point they tried to sell it. You know, that's why I was pissed off middle of the lovers (laughs) on the bridge, because why is this more of a Darren Aronofsky movie (laughs) to the nth power as opposed to a Nora Ephron film for Pete's bleeping sake? (laughs) Definitely not Nora Ephron. This is surprising. This is not French Kiss with Meg Ryan and Kevin Klein. Can it be a Lawrence Kazan movie? (laughs) I I think there's also a place for like, uh, you know, the David Lynch and Leo Crax's of, you know, selling movies. When What do you call that? Uh, Distribution, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, not not distribution, but like uh, advertising. Sure. Like, hey, hey, how, how do we make movies of this? Well, or how, how do we make money out of this? Oh, we can't because uh, this we we can't sell this the same way that we can sell Star Wars, you know. And that's true, but there's other ways to you know. Oh yeah. That if you want to make money, there's ways to make money on movies like this. You just have to go about it in a different way than you. you you're not going to sell this. You're not going to sell this to the uh, MCU crowd, and you're not going to sell this uh, by getting people to the theaters. There's other ways to, uh, and I don't know what these ways are. If I did, I'd be a millionaire. <laughs> but there's the, there's other ways to sell and distribute and make money off of movies like this, so that you can make other ones. You just have to be as creative as the artists are that are making these type of movies. And I I think a lot of people working in the uh, industry to sell movies, I don't think that they're used to, this is what works for this movie. And so we're going to box it all. And we're going to try to sell every movie the same way. And if that movie doesn't fit in the box, then we'll just say, we can't do it. Not knowing that that box is pretty constraining and there's plenty of other possibilities outside of it that they're not even considering. A hundred percent. But we all, we understand. I, <laughs> I understand the marketing. I, we understand that that's what, what marketing. Uh, that's the, that's the marketing. what I'm saying. Sorry. We, oh, sorry, sorry my bad. <laughs> go, go ahead. Yeah. I, I understand the marketing behind this, but it, it, there has to be space for these type of movies. And, you know, just this really negative reaction that I had from watching a lot of both these movies turn and then just being rhapsodic and then negative and rhapsodic, <laughs> these kind of emotions that I go through, we see a lot of movies. I don't go, the fact that I get to, feel this way about his work is really cool and also frustrating because i don't see other filmmakers doing that and maybe it's to your point eric maybe they there's a million other leo uh, leos caraxes out there but they're just boxed in because of their circumstances before we go we also have to mention denis levant in holy motors yeah i, I look hard to beat this performance period right I, we are getting how many characters bruce and they're all eric how many <laughs> Is he, is he is, not a, uh, yeah this this is not a performance this is many performances <laughs> this this might be uh, the the uh this is the ultimate textbook 
if you're teaching an acting class, you have to use this movie and not the full movie, but you take each part and that's each segment of the textbook of uh, Holy Motors. And it's like, this is how, this is an example of great acting in this situation, but this is a great example of acting in this situation. And this is a great example of acting in this situation. And it's all one fucking movie. Yeah. And two hours too can take four hours just two hours <laughs> and i would say and yes by the way this is the time we're spending four hours on these two movies instead of something else that's four hours but um, <laughs> okay <laughs> well, i'm not, um, not going to defend uh when i don't get the links so i'm such a seller I, when i don't get the links i'm not going to defend on 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 the listening podcast we still well at least i still love you zach snyder but uh Turn me I was down, gonna do one, one little comment to go with the Dennis right, Lamont, down. like the <laughs> to also like pile on to how awesome the Dennis Lamont's performances are in this movie. The fact that we know that he's pretending to be these different characters, we see him staging himself to become these different characters, we see him walking into the scene, and the fact that in many of those scenes, I got sucked into the scene and forgot and was like in the scene. Oh, yeah, that's what, I, yeah. 100 percent. that's amazing that's a trick on the filmmaker and the art and the and the yes. actor like how can they do that to us like how did i get into the scene with uh, kylie minogue and start thinking like oh well this is the real characters like that's the trick in this this is the real characters. or when he's there with his daughter oh like this is the real characters and the other ones are just like part of the movie no no that's just part of the movie too ah so good it's so good well it's, it's it, oh go ahead eric I, I i would say anyone listening to this and let, let's say you're watching holy motors and it just doesn't, you know, so some people don't like weird shit and, that, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. It's, you know, taste. But to Bruce's point, if you watch this movie and you hated this, did, you know, were you not engaged like in the, in the specific spots? Like maybe you didn't know what it was about. Maybe we were confused or, or, uh, you know, you know, getting pissed off the movie or whatever, but the, the, yeah, looking at it as an anthology, like in that in that moment, were were you engaged? Were you in like uh, that? That I mean, the best part is the part with the uh, dad picking up his daughter. It's like okay, yeah, he's picking up his daughter and talking to her. Wait, wait, he's not his fucking. He's not her fucking dad. <laughs> and this is like this is like halfway or three quarters of the way through the movie. I should know better right now. But I'm still yeah, that part going, oh, yeah, yeah, the dad's picking up his dad. No, he's not a fucking dad. This is a fucking lead. <laughs> but you know but I was I was just, I was in there. I was in the pocket, so to speak. Well, what Karax is saying, that's his prestige, right? But in his prestige is he just shows everything. He goes, I'm going to make a movie that, in Holy Motors, that some people will find pretentious. And it's filled with artifice. Everything here is filled with artifice. I'm showing you exactly how people are taking their makeup off. Makeup off. There is an actress here. You might have seen her in a movie called Eyes Without a Face. I am gonna put a bleeping mask on her. Yes. I'm gonna. I'm just. I'm showing you everything right now, and you're yeah. gonna get mad at me because it's a little bit pretentious. But guess what? The biggest trick is within this artifice. You're going to feel things. Maybe that you haven't felt before, or you'll surprisingly feel that you never thought you'd feel. There is a moment in this situation, we haven't even mentioned this moment, there's a there's a vignette that deals with mortality between two people that <laughs> literally is so moving. And then at the end of it, it just throws a rug right out of you, but not, yes. in, a, not in a shameful way, but it's just so, so it's, a, it's really a work of art to tie. And again, it's a work of art, but there are things that will matter you about it. For example, Edith Scobe, Eyes Without a Face. Bruce Perky and Eric Holmes saw that movie last week. Both of them really loved that movie. Bruce wanted to, wanted to tell the link about it. But I'm just going to add that he was talking in interviews about how he's frustrated that people always come up to him and ask him if he's a fan of Eyes Without a Face because he specifically tells these people, these fans of Holy Motors, he tells them no. That mask on her, that was just an arbitrary decision. Come on. Come no. on. No. no. You know what? I think Leo's Karaks, I wouldn't believe a thing he says in his interviews. I oh, think wow. he fucking lies all the times in his interviews. <laughs> I think that's, he plays the same shit in his interviews that he does in his movies. So I think that that's just part of it. Like, that's fake too. It's like, it's like, it's a meta, 
it's like we're in like one of those meta realities that <laughs> i don't know man you think he's like, like he, yeah yeah like you said the whole thing beauty weird beauty weird like that's literally him like you said just pointing it out to the whole world and uh, still making it work uh, yeah re re real quick can i speak on the uh pretentious um sure a, a, lo a lot of people bring up movies like this or lovers yeah. on the bridge as pretentious um, right here, I have the definition of pretentious, attempting to impress by affecting greater importance, talent, culture, etc., than it is actually possessed, which sounds a lot like a four hour superhero movie or <laughs> Avengers Endgame. Okay. So if, if, if we're going to use pretentious <laughs> as a pejorative from here on out, let's not use pretentious as it was artful and I didn't understand it. Therefore, I'm going to push it away and call it pretentious let's call pretentious what it is more important than what is actually there which a lot of times is not art movies they're not art house movies aren't the pretentious ones a lot of time the pretentious movies are the fucking superhero movies that they keep shoving down people's throat wonder woman 84 extremely yes. pretentious rise of skywalker rise of skywalker and i love i love star wars i'm not shitting on star wars i will shit on rise of skywalker all day there, there, <laughs> there's a little star wars thing right there i love star wars not shitting on it but if we're going to talk about pretentious let's talk about rise of skywalker what's the whole point of rise of skywalker you have to have known a bunch of stuff it gives you clues of stuff because it's it's got the pretense that you already know what it's talking about it's self-important and it's a shitty movie also i mean it's not a shitty movie because it's pretentious but you know um yeah <laughs> i'm sorry i just want to get that ran out no i agree pretentious is is, is self-important and all ultimately unearned talent that it claims to have and yeah. I don't think a lot of artistic movies, David Lynch isn't pretentious, you know, David Lynch isn't pretentious. He's just a good filmmaker. And maybe sometimes a lot of people use uh, pretentious as a shield to say, I didn't get it. Therefore it's pretentious and I can dismiss it. Well, David, you know, David Lynch is talented. He has his things you're, he's going for and you might not get it. I don't get it a lot of the times, but that doesn't mean it's bad. You know, pretentious doesn't always mean bad. And I think a lot of people use that as a crutch to shield themselves from wanting to dig deeper a lot of time in art. And that was very pretentious of me to say, but I no, said, no, no. I think I think about that. I think a lot of people regarding the pretension stuff, I think a lot of people will will um ignore or overlook Holy Motors and the lovers on the bridge because of that pretentious tag that is placed on it. But the good thing about it is like we're talking about artifice. You can just jump, just jump over that fence because his work is not pretentious whatsoever. It's like what art should be maddening, frustrating, all over the place, messy. It doesn't cater. It, like you said, it's uncompromising, Bruce. I find his stuff to be, I can't, by the way, I can't wait to watch his other films. Bruce, to yeah. his, you've seen his other work. Do they reach I haven't almost... seen all of them yet. I haven't seen, uh, I started watching um, Boy Meets Girl, which is his first feature and it didn't quite capture me but i'm going to go back to it move sang though his second mm -hmm. feature which a lot of people got pissed off about it, about at the time i think it's kind of his love letter to all the french early filmmakers move sang is one i would say you guys should both check out um because you can see a lot of the things getting worked out and that's when he met juliette binoche Very and cool. that's i mean he the camera loves her in that movie and denise levant's in that one and uh, it's got some pretty amazing sequences and it's got some weird stuff. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. You're going to be in there and be like, what the fuck? Uh, <laughs> Julie Del Delpy too. Very, very young Julie Delpy. It's worth checking out. And Pola X isn't available anywhere. Unbelievable. So Unbelievable. Pola X I've heard is kind of his, it's kind of his least um, kind of over the top movie. So it may not be as good as these other ones. It's basically, if you think about it, he's did, he's done, um, you know, he did Lovers on the Bridge and then like 20 years later, almost, he does Holy Motors with only Pola X in the middle as kind of like a palate cleanser for himself, I think. Although I will say I have watched and you guys should all check out uh, Tokyo, Tokyo Exclamation Point. Right. That is worth it because that is the origin story of Monsieur Merde, the crazy guy that drive, climbs out of the sewer. Oh, and cool. this, this is a three-part movie with three directors 
And the other two directors are Michelle Gondry and another one. Yep. You know, the other one is, I believe it's Bong Joon Ho. Ooh. Yes. My goodness. So you should check that out. That's from like 2000. And, let me look, look it up. 2008. 2008. Okay. So just called... so basically that's the only other thing he did. Tokyo exclamation point. Okay. Um, so it's got a whole extended sequence with the same character that you see crawling out of the sewer in this movie, uh, probably about a 30 minute, 35 minute segment with that guy. And once again, he did crazy stuff. He went over there with this idea of this character and he took over, he said, I want this guy to be th throwing bombs and having a terrorist attack on, a, on the most busy bridge in Tokyo. So they like kind of go in there and guerrilla style start shooting all this stuff with uh, flashes. They don't have actual grenades, but they're doing flashes and stuff with that character running around. And, um, you know, some of the production gets arrested <laughs> during it. So that's what this guy does, man, you know? You know, he just makes, yeah, it's just crazy. So I, I saw Holy Motors on Canopy, guys. How, how where can other listeners li get check out Holy Motors? How did you guys see it? YouTube, YouTube. Okay, we're to be on YouTube. It's free on Tubi. You can watch it on Tubi. It's free on Tubi, and I. It is you know, not free on YouTube. <laughs> it's not it's not free <laughs> on YouTube whatsoever. For just final thoughts on layouts or Leos Caracs for me. He, I'm so glad that we're, we're covering him because he's a filmmaker that I can't wait to watch more of his work become really frustrated at moments, but at the end, I, I'm expecting to be, it to be a very sublime experience. It was, a I actually crammed in his movies within a 24 hour span. So I feel I, it's my head is swimming with thoughts. So it, that's a good, good thing. Eric Holmes, final thoughts on, on these films and on the filmmaker. Yeah. Uh, I think, uh, uh, lovers on the bridge. There's a certain group. I think my sister might like something like that. Um, cause she likes the romantic movies and it, it, oh, it's weird because some people that are into that might be turned off by some of it, but I mean, this guy is a very interesting filmmaker and I'm like, uh, what he's got the musical coming out. I'm going to watch the musical. I'm excited for anything this guy comes out with. Whether or not I'll like it, probably will. But <laughs> I, I, I think that's less important than I'm more excited to see, like, what fucking other weird shit does this guy have up his sleeve? I'm, because he's, he, he just, I don't know. I, all the stuff he does that I've seen so far is really interesting and really crazy. And I don't think he cares, which I appreciate. And he just kind of goes for it. And I, I look forward to seeing what he does next. And whether or not I like it is irrelevant because he's an artist and he's gonna do what he wants anyway. And uh I'm more I'm more interested into seeing what falls out of his brain more so than I'm interested in whether or not I personally will like it. Because I that's think that's great. the least important thing of anything. Well, I think you you have a good point. Sometimes he sometimes he you feel like he doesn't care. He makes movies for himself, but sometimes by not caring, that's the greatest act of caring because you come up with, like you were talking about, Eric, just a very intriguing, interesting, and everlasting work of art. You know, and uh, Bruce, final thoughts. Uh, just that I was, I was happy to like bring something that neither of you had seen, and also to bring something that I that I'm excited about and have similar. I'm kind of right between you two. Like I get frustrated by him too, but I was really excited to bring something where as much as I love discovering, you know, an old filmmaker I'd never heard of before, but the fact that we can bring somebody here that still potentially has more greatness to come. Like I want to be able to do that once in a while too. So we can be like, uh, and, and I say it again, I don't think of many directors that don't, that make movies so seldomly that I'm so excited for the next movie to come out just to see it. Um, and I feel like the problem is kind of like Kubrick, if he keeps at this pace, you only have so many more movies from this guy. If he's only yeah. going to make one about every nine to 10 years, I mean, how many more movies are we going to get? Maybe three, four. <laughs> I mean, so let's get them while we can, I guess. Uh, so yeah, it was fun. All right, for our next director spotlight, Eric Holmes, we're, we're going into this different wave of filmmaking as well. Can you tell our listeners what to expect for the next director spotlight? Uh, yes, uh, let me, uh, that, I mean, 
Now, to be fair, this may be a bit pretentious of me, but <laughs> <laughs> very cool, very good. Um, but uh, we're we're gonna get into the uh, Dogma ninety five movies, and so uh, I I don't know about you guys. I've heard of Dogma ninety five. I'm familiar with it, but I haven't really seen any of it that I'm aware of. Um, and there's like the whole list of stuff that falls under Dogma 95. And so this one's not really a director's spotlight because one of the, uh, one of the rules in Dogma 95 is the director, you don't mention the director, like the, you don't, I, I guess I could pull it up, but it, it's all about storytelling. They're set with limitations to be as pure storytelling as possible. And so, uh, I figure we'll start with the dogma number one called The Celebration, directed by, well, I'm not going to tell you, am I? Because the director is... <laughs> and uh, so uh, the three of us will do that one. And then I I got one that I'm going to do, and I wanted each of you to pick one that you're going to do. Okay. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll tease it now, but, uh, you know, you won't know until uh, we do the Dogma 95 uh, director's spotlight, air quotes. And uh, I haven't even got this, the rules yet on how we will direct these. <laughs> right, cool. But uh, yeah, we'll, we'll have some, we'll have some, this is absolutely pretentious. This is textbook pretension, what I'm doing right now. But again, like but, you said, pretentious, being pretentious, it shouldn't, does not have to be a bad thing if it's executed no. in such a way like these films are. No, but uh, yeah, what uh, I guess what I'm going to try to do is like how Dogma 95 is trying to get distill uh, storytelling to its most per uh, not perfect, to its apex, but, uh, to its to its um, no like its core, uh, pure core elements kind of yeah, or... core, yeah, core elements. It's it's pure state. I want to try to get movie criticism down to its pure state. <laughs> You know, you know, I'm a co-host on this podcast, right? So that's yeah. kind of impossible, correct? Eric, so I am impure. I am impure. I'm sorry to tell you. I'm in the mud. I, you no, know what? I'm going to change Holy Cinema. I'm going to change my, my name to Mudbound. So. I will be Monsieur Merd Perquet. <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah, this uh, this will be a fun one. I like it. Whether or not you're into the Dogma 95 movies, I, I think the next dire director spotlight for Dogma 95 will have some fun surprises on that. Well, so look, you know, Eric, is this the reason? Okay, so you're you want to research this, or maybe when you were at a younger age, you were inspired by this movement, or this is a movement mo movement that you want to just really swim into this is more of a thing that i was more or less ignorant like i kind of i heard about it i kind of knew what it was but i didn't really i just thought like oh that's that that's the thing i heard about and then i started looking it up recently actually and then i was like oh this might be a fun thing to do and and i think our director's spotlight is a perfect kind of avenue in which to talk about that as opposed to talking about the the films themselves more it'll be interesting to talk about the the films and how they follow the rules the dogma 95 rules and how successful they are you know in in your opinions which is why i want to have the one that we all talk about but i also want to have another one that each of us pick cover. and kind of uh not not cover not so much cover the story but cover how it fits into the dogma 95 rules sure. and how it uh works is pure storytelling and mm -hmm. we'll see if it does or not all right listeners you know so that'll be in a couple of weeks when we do dogma 95 my my the caveat the, the warning i have for that episode which comes in a couple of weeks again like i said is please listen to eric holmes as he's going to be spearheading this episode as well as bruce perky he's a big cinephile just a little story before we go. Years back, I received a VHS copy of this movie called The Celebration. And I was offered to do a one-on-one -on -one with the unnamed director who I'm sure most of you being cinephiles know the name of the director. I left that VHS copy sitting on my desk in Culver City, California, never to watch it. I was probably doing something like going to screeners of like the, the Mighty Ducks one or, or something like that during that time. So please, when you listen to that episode, take my, <laughs> my analysis of Dogma 95 with, oh, by the way, you know what? I'm going to give myself a little bit of credit. I remember getting the, getting the Academy screener to, what is it called? Breaking the Waves and being blown away by that experience. So I will, I will say, though I am stuck in the mud, there's some, sometimes once in a while, I'll, I will see the light. So, all right. So that is it 
Bruce Perky, this is your this was your show. We, we, close it out. Close it out for us. Holy uh, what? Yeah, I just thank you for going down the path with me of this craziness. And everybody, go watch Holy Motors tonight. You're going to have an experience. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to have an experience. Go watch Holy Motors tonight, folks. Get, tell us what you think of Holy Motors. Also, see the lovers on the bridge. It's called a, rom it's a dark romantic story. Tell us if you love it or you don't. Or maybe there is there is no in-between with this guy's work. Right, Eric? No, no. He's uh, You're either on board or you're not. Or maybe you'll get on board later. Or maybe you'll stay on board for a while and you'll fall off. But whatever it is, doesn't matter. It's his movies and they're they're great. At least in his mind. At least, and at least in his mind. At least in our minds. And yeah, we will. We will see you guys next week, where we will be doing reviews of the Toll. And Bruce, what was the other movie that that I, you got a screen? We, we got screening links for the Toll and Happily, Happily, right? And the Toll and Happily, the movie directed by writer director Ben David Grabinski. We will see you guys next week on Find Your Film. <laughs>